good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, my presentation. My name is Sarah Police. Um, I go under the Twitter handle Sarah TP. And if anyone's tweeting today, you might like to add the hashtag for accessibility, which is A11Y. Everyone takes it for two L's, but what they've actually done is they've taken 11 letters out between the A and the Y, and that's how we get A11Y or Ally as we refer to it verbally. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about creating dynamic and accessible web content in Drupal 7 using a W3C um, standard called WayARIA. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm currently the web accessibility evangelist, Q, <laughs> um, for Access IQ. And in essence, I just get out there and I talk about accessibility. Um, back in 2002, I can still remember what my, um, I guess, the, the blinding moment for me understanding accessibility was when I was at a, um, the Australian Accessibility Conference, the Aussie Way Conference, and someone brought up an image map in a browser, turned off images, and there was absolutely no way for someone who was, for instance, blind or vision impaired to actually navigate past the home page because all of that information was inaccessible. And I still remember today the feeling of sitting there. It was the aha moment for me. Um, throughout 2002 to 2010, I'd done a variety of things. I've got a techie background, but I'm not a dev and I'm not a Drupal developer. I am a Drupal user. Um, Access IQ that I mentioned I work for runs on a Drupal 7 site and is accessible, as does Media Access Australia, which is our parent company. And um, we've got a few other Drupal sites hanging around. So I'm fairly good at using Drupal, but I've never had to actually um, do any coding in Drupal. Um, so I've um, done a range of things. I've got the techie background. I've got a marketing background. Um, and in 2010, I came to work for Media Access Australia. And then when they set up Access IQ, which is um, a social enterprise aimed at actually helping uh, government, non-government, devs, anyone who wants to make accessible content, we're there to assist through um, training and services and content. Um, and I became full-time uh, for Access IQ and go around talking about accessibility and doing training and generally being a jack of all trades, pretty much. So I wanted to ask, how many people have heard any of the following statements? People who use screen readers, and just in case anyone in the audience doesn't know what a screen reader is, for someone who is blind or vision impaired and has trouble seeing the screen, there's a piece of assistive technology called a screen reader. And essentially, a screen reader uses text-to-speech technology to actually read out what's on the screen. Um, usually, that's delivered in an audible fashion through your speakers, sound, so on and so forth. But it can also be converted into Braille. Um, and so for people who are Braille users, they have what's called a refreshable Braille display. And it pops up a whole lot of pins, which um, the Braille language is actually made of little um, sets of six pins. And depending on the orientation they're in is what, what letter it is. So that information can also be communicated through a Braille device. Um, today, you'll see a number of examples of screen readers. Um, one live one, because I promised myself I wasn't doing live demonstrations. And then they showed the, um, the Australian Law website. And I thought, oh, that would be cool to demonstrate. And yeah, here I am doing live demonstrations again. But there's also going to be, a, there's four videos today that I'm going to play. Unfortunately, this projector is 800 by 600, really not up to the task. The videos are quite grainy. I will explain what's happening. And by and large, it is a screen reader reading out information. So you will definitely hear it. But all of the videos are up on YouTube, as are my slides on SlideShare. So all of the links and that are all in SlideShare. So don't worry about jotting them down or anything like that. So back to what I was asking. Who's heard the, the myth that people who use screen readers just turn off JavaScript? So you can't use JavaScript if you're building an accessible website. A few people, maybe about five or six. That's really good. Usually, maybe because you're all here and you're all interested in accessibility, you're a little bit smarter than that. But that's one of the myths that's of, often um, sort of passed around. The second one is that you can't have dynamic content on an accessible website, which um, has anyone heard that one? Heard it but wouldn't believe it. Lovely. <laughs> and the last one, accessible websites are boring. No? I've got a good audience. This is really good. Well, these are the, th a 
Well, these are the three myths that often um, we hear and often we have to debunk. And today, talking about ARIA, I guess, addresses these three myths. First off, that uh, people are not turning JavaScript off anymore because there are ways to actually make JavaScript or AJAX content accessible. Um, that they, and you know, by that, there's also ways to make dynamic content accessible. And so we're getting away from that whole um, concept of an accessible website has to be boring. I can't do all of those neat, you know, funky things that I want to do. So I mentioned Way Aria. So Aria stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and it's a standard that's published by the um, W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. Uh, the Web Accessibility Initiative are the guys who also publish um, a lot of the other accessibility standards. WCAG 2, or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which I'll probably talk and touch on today, um, is often the main one we look at. Um, if anyone here is working on government websites, you probably would have found that they're um, asking for accessible websites that conform with WCAG 2. And this is because in um, June of 2010, uh, the AGAMO, the Australian Government Information Management Organisation, released the National Transition Strategy, um, otherwise known as the NTS. And the NTS essentially outlined that all government, um, all federal, state and territory um, websites needed to be level A compliant, which is the first level accessibility by the end of 2010, so we've been and gone past that deadline, and they must be AA compliant by the end of 2014. So this has done a huge amount for accessibility. It's brought accessibility back on the radar, and obviously the, the demand for people who can create accessible websites and web content um, has definitely gone up. So the problem we really grapple with with dynamic content comes down to the information that is communicated from the user agent, so the web browser, through to the assistive technology. In essence, when you've got static content that doesn't, isn't um, being driven by um, a scripting language, there's a contract between these two items. And so elements like roles and states um, actually are communicated through to the assistive technology. So for instance, um, if a screen reader hits a link, um, it looks at that link, it knows it's a, um, it has an ahref reference, and so it actually says to the user, that this is a link, and then it will actually announce the link text. And all of that information, that the fact that it is a link or that it is a button, is communicated from the UI or user agent through to the assistive technology. But when we've got JavaScript actually driving that UI component and actually changing elements within the DOM on the fly, what happens is if we don't in use a technology like ARIA, that information, the changes in roles and states and actions, values, um, changes in relations, doesn't actually translate through to the assistive technology. So a good example is um, some, uh, let's say you've got a news site and um, in the corner you've got a little area that is actually dynamically updating. So every minute that someone's on a, a website, it actually um, asks for the latest headline and it updates automatically. Now for a screen reader user, we, well, what I should say is, visually we recognise that something has changed. But for a screen reader user, they don't actually know that something has changed on that website. So they either don't know that that change has happened, or if they happen to actually be reading that out at the time using their screen reader, suddenly it changes from reading about, you know, yesterday's heat wave to... Give me an example, of, I've forgotten the example. What's a nice news headline? floods to floods um, happening now. So that's why we actually need to communicate this information um, to the screen reader. So ARIA actually is all about HTML attributes. It's essentially an extension to HTML. And the attributes actually are divided into two main groups. The first group is we have way ARIA roles. Um, and within those roles we have four broad categories. We have um, abstract roles, so they're actually not used when we're um, creating a website. But we do have docu uh, widget roles, we have document structure roles, and we also have landmark roles. The other elements we have are states and properties. So these are to actually um, indicate to a screen reader when something actually changes. So this includes widgets that are updating content um, or are actually changing state 
due to a user interaction. Um, live regions, so updating content that's just refreshing on a screen. Um, things like drag and drop elements, tree elements, and also relationship attributes. So these can be used certainly in all of your um, websites, but they're definitely important for web applications where we're trying to simulate a lot of those things that we're used to in a desktop environment, which currently are, are quite accessible when you say, you know, running under Windows or Mac. But now we're moving into a web environment and we need to make sure that all of those interactive elements are also accessible. So what we'll look at today, um, first we'll look at uh, page structure and in particular uh, landmark roles. We're then get going to look at um, ARIA live regions for updating content, um, using ARIA on forms and lastly um, using ARIA for widgets. Um, and at the end, uh, touching on uh, Drupal and the, um, what you can find, what ARIA elements you can find in Drupal currently. I've tended to focus in this presentation more on the ARIA side of things rather than the Drupal side of things. First off, I'm not a Drupal expert, but secondly, you guys know how to patch modules and that kind of thing. So it's more about communicating what ARIA can do so that you know and you can take that back into your workplace. So you're probably familiar with skip links. Um, there's a success criteria, it's probably the only success cr criteria I'm going to quote, which is 2.1.4, and it's all about bypassing blocks of content. And essentially it's um, that we have repeating blocks of content on, on a website, you know, our banner, our navigation elements. Now, as we get familiar with um, the website, we might not want to hear all of the information and the banner and all the information in the navigation. Um, for a screen reader, they actually read information out linearly through the page from the top to the bottom. And so they're forced to listen to all that information before they arrive at the, the actual main content area, which is often the area that they're interested in. And so because there was no way to actually mark up a page with um, semantic information, um, we used skip links, which is essen essentially just anchor links that usually are put at the top of a page. And in this case, on the NAB site, they've got a skip to content link that when activated takes you down to the introducing the new way to trade. So it was really a workaround because there wasn't anything better in place. What ARIA gives us, it actually gives us nine um, landmark roles that we can, we can use to mark up our page structure. You'll see that some of them actually do overlap with HTML5. For instance, we've got a role equals navigation and there's the nav item in HTML5. Currently, screen readers support um, ARIA much more than they actually, um, actually support HTML5 elements. So if you are coding websites in HTML5, I'd still recommend you use the ARIA roles, even if you are using the HTML5 nav element or so on and so forth. So to briefly go through the nine roles, we've got um, an ARIA role, which is banner, which is essentially you know, the information that you've got on the top. It usually consists of your logo and so on. Generally, roles are assigned to um, divs and they can actually be nested. Um, there's the role equals search to actually um, mark out your search box. This is particularly important for people using screen readers because often they will use the, and rely on the search function even more than we do because it's an easy way for them to find if there's some information on the website or even um, the web page. So it's important to mark up that area. We've got role equals um, navigation. Now, this role can be used multiple times. Um, the roles that only should be used once, um, according to the spec, are banner, main, and content info. So we can have multiple navigation items. Um, role equals main, which is essentially your main content area. And you, could also, you can also have role equals form and role equals application. Having said that, application is not very well supported by any assistive technology, so I wouldn't actually recommend using it right now. There's also an area role equals complementary, which is for complementary information. So, you know, often you've got your right-hand side um, elements that might be promotional elements or something like that. They could be assigned a role of complementary. Um, having said that, complementary can be nested within main, and we'll see an example in a minute of where that occurs. And our last one is content info, and that essentially is the elements usually found in the footer. 
One thing to note is for the uh, roles that you can actually use multiple times within a web page, it's really good to use another ARIA um, element called, um, or attribute I should say, called ARIA label. Um, so the example here is we've got two navigation um, areas, one which has an ARIA label of main menu and another one which has an ARIA, uh, ARIA label of submenu. When a screen reader is actually skipping from landmark to landmark, that ARIA label will actually be read out. So if there's three navigation areas on the page, it will actually not only identify them as navigation, it will also identify them by their label so that a user can actually differentiate whether they've, whether they've hit the main menu navigation or sub-menu navigation. So um, I'm going to go to the Government of Canada website. Um, later on in the presentation, I've got two Drupal distributions that actually have be create, been created to be accessible out of the box. And one is the uh, WET, the Website Experience Toolkit. And um, it is a, actually has been designed by the uh, Government of Canada. And the Government of, Can or Government of Canada website is based on this particular module. Bear with me, I've got a few things open. Okay, so this is the first video. Um, as I said, apologies for it being grainy. What I'm showing you here is, is that screen reader users can actually navigate landmark roles in two ways. One way is, is that they can actually bring up a dialog box, which is what we'll see here, and uh, it will actually allow them to navigate the landmark roles um, in a tree type structure. So you can see we've got some nested elements there, We've got search, um, which is nested under banner. And we've got uh, complementary and content info, which is listed, nest, uh, ooh, nested under main. Landmarks radio button checked out D. Tree view. Navigation one of five. Banner expanded two of five. Level one search one of one. Level 0 navigation 3 of 5. Main expanded 4 of 5. Level 1 complementary 1 of 2. Content info 2 of 2 level 1. Level 0 content info expanded 5 of 5. Level 1 navigation 1 of 2. Navigation 2 of 2 level 1. File submenu 1 of 4. No, go away. You're too early. <laughs> so that's just giving you an example of how a screen reader user may actually uh, look at the overall navigation structure of a page using landmark roles. The next video, which I'll queue up now, is, um, is exactly the same page, but instead I've actually gone through this page using um, a shortcut key. So there's the shortcut key D actually jumps from landmark to landmark. I should say that all of these demos are done using um, a screen reader called NVDA. Um, it's free and open source, so it fits in very well with this conference. You can download it. And it's homegrown. It's actually um, developed by two blind developers up in Queensland. So um, if you're looking for a free screen reader to test on Windows, um, that's your guy. And if I can encourage you, these guys, are they list off grants and or actually project funding to, to do this. So if you are using it and you can spare some money to give them a donation, you can do that through their website. I really would encourage it because it's the only free solution out there. By comparison, you've got commercial solutions like JAWS, which is the, um, the key solution for um, the Windows environment. It costs about $1,500 to buy, and then the upgrades are also um, close to $1,000. So I really want to support these guys and allow them to keep on doing what they're doing because they're just doing an amazing job. And they're the guys that are often implementing things first. Navigation Landmark Government of Canada Navigation Bar Heading Level 2 Banner Landmark Government of Canada Visited Link Search landmark search heading level two, navigation landmark site navigation bar. So I'm just going to stop it there. The um, where it says navigation landmark landmark site navigation bar. That's our ARIA label tag coming in and actually being read out and communicated. 
um, by the screen reader. Heading level 2. Main landmark home heading level 1. Complementary landmark supplemental content heading level 2. So that just gives you an idea of what a screen reader um, hears for landmarks and also how beneficial it is. Um, I would still encourage you to include skip links within your template. Um, the reason is that uh, although um, screen readers are actually reading out landmark roles, um, you can't actually use and get to landmark roles using your web browser. And you know, it is useful for people, say, with um, who are screen magnifier users who actually magnify the screen rather than having it read out to them. They might find those skip links useful, and at the moment, because the web browsers don't actually support landmark roles and have, you know, shortcut keys to use them, I think it's still good to implement both solutions. Okay. So there's quite good um, support for um, landmark roles within assistive technologies. Um, JAWS 11, 12, and 13 has complete support. Chromebox, which is a um, screen reader that works specifically with Chrome, has complete support as well. VoiceOver, which is the Mac screen reader, which works on Mac OS X and also on iOS devices, supports all landmarks except for forms, and NVDA supports all landmarks except for applications and forms. Um, Window Eyes doesn't support ARIA landmarks, but thankfully there's only a small base of users still using Window Eyes. So the second topic is actually using ARIA in forms. And as I said, I think ARIA landmarks and um, ARIA, the ARIA elements in forms are two of the most easy things to be doing right now with um, very minimal effort and just working it into your um, coding practice. So there's a few um, attributes that can help. The first is um, ARIA required. So this attribute actually um, is added to your input element and essentially means that um, the uh, input element is a required form field. So this will be communicated again through the screen reader so that when a user tabs into a form field, it will actually read out the label, such as first name, and it will also identify the form field as being required. Um, again, if you're using HTML5, do use both the HTML5 required and also the ARIA required. Um, another nice element is um, ARIA described by. So Often there's information in this example, it's where it's got extra information about the characteristics of a password or um, what you need to, things you need to meet in order for your password to be valid. Um, there's different ways that you can do that in forms without ARIA. Usually, um, at a minimum, we suggest that it's at the very, very top of the, the form field. So as a person navigates similarly through a form, they hear all of the information about restrictions up the top, and then they navigate through the form field. But an even better way to do it with ARIA described by is actually to be able to associate um, the input field with that piece of text. So when the user again tabs into that input field, it will actually read out not just the form label, but it will also read out um, the information that is identified in the by ARIA described by. So in this case, we've got a paragraph with an ID of um, password required that says your password must be eight characters in length and include one number. And that's linked to the input field using ARIA described by with a value of password required. Um, another nice one, ARIA invalid. So this can be used in um, form validation. If there is a field that is in invalid, you can actually inject an ARIA invalid equals true into that form. And so as a user moves through that form, Again, when they hit that form field, it will communicate that that form field is invalid. You could also use the ARIA described by also to point to an error message as well um, that informs the user of the error and also gives suggestions on how they might fix it. And the last two elements are um, ARIA label and ARIA labeled by. Um, so the purpose of these elements are the same, but you use ARIA labeled by if the label text is visible on the screen. Um, if the label text isn't visible on the screen, then you use um, ARIA label. Nice example of how this is used is um, this comes from a web aim presentation. Um, it's a little form that says self-destruct this page in form field five seconds. And they've used um, ARIA label, uh, sorry, ARIA labeled by 
to actually um, associate with three elements. They've associated with the label element, the time element, and the seconds element. So it will actually read out self-destructive page in five seconds all as one block. because I have a horrible, um, horrible thing of going over time. Um, ARIA Live Regions. So I mentioned ARIA Live Regions are fantastic for dynamic content like stock tickers or news items that are dynamically updated. What you can do is you can actually mark a particular region within a, a web page with an ARIA Live attribute. And there's three values that the ARIA Live attribute can take. Um, the first one is off, and th this just means that the updates are not announced to the user. Uh, the second one is polite, um, and that means that when something updates, those updates will only be announced to the user if the user is idle. So if they're not actually reading out anything else on the screen and suddenly they stop um, accessing the page, it will actually then read out that information. The last one is ARIA Live is asser equals assertive. So that's where, for really important updates, the updates are announced as soon as possible, but they don't actually interrupt the user. So often users, when they're reading a web page, they'll use the arrow down key, and it will read sort of chunks of, of text, maybe about 10 to 15 words. So for instance, if a user was using that method of reading a page, when they got to the end of that particular chunk of text, it would actually jump in and alert to them to the fact that there was a change. There are also other attributes for live re regions that actually communicate relevance. So there's an ARIA busy attribute, which takes the values true or false. And the assistive technology such as screen readers will only announce changes once ARIA busy is equal to false. So this actually allows you some control about when you actually communicate something to the user. Um, there's ARIA atomic, um, which also takes the values of true or false. And it only reads out um, actual changes um, or the entire live region. So if you've got a, if you've marked a, up a live region, but there's a certain only certain text within that live region that's updating, then you can actually ask it just to up, just to read out those updates or to read out the whole um, lot of text again. Um, the last one is ARIA relevant. So the values are additions, removals, or text. So you can. It actually reads out the um, changes to the live region depending on what your value is. So for the next demonstration, we're actually going to go to the Yahoo 7 website. Okay. So unfortunately, this is probably one of the ones that's going to be really hard to, re to look at. It's, this video is broken up into two pieces. The first piece is um, I've got a uh, firebug open here down the bottom, and we've got the Yahoo certs on the top. And I'll give you some context because it's really hard to, re to look at. But um, what I'm going to start to do is type in um, Drupal into Yahoo 7. And if you could see it, what would actually be happening is this text down here, which um, reads, uh, it's a div class, and it's aria live equals polite, uh, role equals status, and then it's got some text which, at the moment, is no suggestions. And as I start to type letters in, what you'll see is, is that that no suggestions actually will be dynamically updating with the number of suggestions in the drop-down list that are there. Um, the second part of the video is then what you hear with the screen reader, so it will essentially be mimicking what you'd see in Firefox, but you can have a look at it on YouTube a little bit later as well. So we're still at 10 suggestions. And now we hit five suggestions, two suggestions, and one suggestion. Search query combo box collapsed has auto complete editable blank. V expanded. R 10 suggestions, U 10 suggestions, P 10 suggestions, A 10 suggestions, L 10 suggestions, space T C 5 suggestions, O 2 suggestions, M 1 suggestions. Drupal Commerce. Drupal Commerce Yahoo 7 sir. So that's 
process, we're using um, a combination of ARIA live regions um, and also some other ARIA attributes to insert that so that the user actually knows that there are suggestions coming up underneath that text box. And I find this particularly important. Um, I remember going to the Woolworths site and on the Woolworths form it asks me, and I was actually testing this for accessibility, it asked me for s to sign up but it actually has to verify your address against a central database. And it had the suggestions popping up in that same way as suggestions underneath. And that was not communicated to the screen reader at all. And so unless you actually typed in your address exactly right, there was no way to know that if you just pressed the down arrow, you would actually get a number of options and you'd be able to select that option which was being sourced by the database, which would then have a much better chance of actually being correct. So this is, I find, really important for um, forms such as that as well. So the last topic is um, ARIA for widgets. Now, ARIA for widgets is a huge area that you could come across. And um, at the end of this presentation, I've got a number of um, references, um, including um, this uh, code from Accessible jQuery UI Components Demonstration, which is on GitHub, which I do encourage you to go and have a look at because it's got some really nice examples of um, what you can do with um, with code examples. And if I actually, no, I haven't got it open. I'll just click through because um, it's a, a really nice um, library. So it has, um, it actually has examples for sliders, progress bars, menu bars, buttons, dialogues, checkboxes, accordions, trees, carousels, tabs, tooltips, autocomplete, and date picker. Um, and if you become familiar with the screen reader, you can run the screen reader over the examples which um, come under here um, and actually see what they're, what's, do, what's happening um, and actually um, have a look at the code. So in my usual way, as I said, I wasn't going to do live demonstrations and then they, um, this morning um, we talked about the Australian Law Reform Commission and I thought, ah, oh, look at that menu. I wonder whether that menu is accessible or not. And so. I'd like to run the screen reader over it. It is accessible, but I would actually like you to think when you see how um, NVDA runs over it is, is it actually usable for a user who's navigating through a menu? Taskbar, 40 news and media, get Australian law, out of list, skip to content, link. Just um, ignore me while I get to the bit I'm looking for. Login, link, contact, list with large, reset, out of list, shopping cart, link. Okay, so we're just about to tab into the main menu. List with six items home visited, link home, alt shift one. About link, alt shift two. List with 13 items, annual reports, link. Commissioners, link. Corporate information, link. Consultation, link. Policies, link. 30 years of law reform, link. Indigenous consultation, link. International outreach, link. Curvy cup, link. Law reform process, link. Legal internship program, link. Access to information link. Careers link. Out of list inquiries link. Inquiries alt shift three. And at this point I think if you weren't interested in anything to do with about and you could have determined that from hitting about the first time, you'd spend a whole lot of time listening to 13 extra items that you didn't really need to. Now, look, I'm all for practical solutions and I'm all for things being as accessible as they can. Um, but the next demonstration will actually show how you can use ARIA um, to actually be able to navigate and expand menu items and not have to make it into that very, very long list type structure where essentially a screen reader has to listen to all of the list items and all of the sub-menu items before they actually get through to the end. So for NVDA, NV exit, Austria. from the ex um, GitHub uh, example I just showed you. Uh, the screen reader is going to be uh, navigating through the menu, which is file, edit, view, and more options. File submenu one of four. Edit submenu two of four. 
View submenu 3 of 4. More options submenu 4 of 4. File submenu 1 of 4. Oh. So all there's the there's instructions up the top, but all I was doing there is actually using the cross arrow to navigate through each of those menu items. I could have also used the the tab element, um, the tab key at least to get from those items. And once I hit file, um, I can use the down arrow to um, actually expand out that sub menu. Open one of six. Save two of six. Save has three of six. Recent documents submenu four of six. Close five of six. Quit six of six. Copy one of four. Full screen one of three. So because I'm in the submenu, I can actually just move across into the next submenu as well, which is what I'm doing um, there. File submenu one of four. Open one of six. <coughs> File submenu one of four. Edit submenu two of four. So again, that's another way of interacting with the menu where um, I went into file, I got into the submenu. The beep you heard was me pressing escape, which brought me back up to the level one menu item and then I could navig navigate across. So that's a completely, um, uh, a completely keyboard operable um, menu item by someone. So it's not, we tend to focus with ARIA on people who are blind and vision impaired using screen readers because obviously it's the communication with the screen reader. But in this case, this is also for people with a physical impairment where they might only be able to use the keyboard or even to use what's called a switch device where they have one or, or two or three main switches that actually replace the um, more complex keyboard because they don't have the fine motor control that actually allows them to use the keyboard. So I'm not going to go into all of the code. You can have a look at that on the, um, uh, the jQuery website. So lastly, looking at um, Drupal with Way Aria. So I'll be completely upfront and say that this might not um, cover everything that's um, in Drupal 7 and also coming in Drupal 8. However, I do know there are a number of Drupal 7 themes with WayAria. Um, Boron, Genesis, um, Panels, 960, GS, they all have ARIA landmarks um, already as part of them. Um, some ways that you can also get more information or uh, become involved with the Drupal accessibility community. So there's the accessibility um, Drupal group, which is spearheaded by um, Mike Gifford. Um, he does fantastic work. Um, he has contacted um, a lot of us actually just in the last week or so to say, hey guys, look, if you've made any updates to Drupal Core um, it from Drupal 7, please let us know because we want to incorporate that into Drupal 8 so that Drupal 8 becomes even more accessible out of the box. So if any of you are working on accessible websites and haven't um, submitted that, that it, ooh, Hasn't, haven't submitted um, any of those patches back up, um, I would suggest that you do so. He's also put together a list of Drupal sites in the disability sector, and I guess, you know, being in the disability sector, they tend to, to be accessible. So if you are looking at Drupal sites that have been um, built and, and are more than likely accessible, then I suggest having a look at that list. Um, as I mentioned before, there's actually two Drupal distributions that um, have focused on accessibility. Um, the first one is the web, um, I think it actually should be web, W-E-T. Anyway, W-E-T, um, which as I said was done by the Government of Canada, um, are up and can, can be downloaded. The other one which was recently released at the end of last year by Previous Next was AGA. Um, so AGOV has been packaged so that it is accessible out of the box. It has Drupal Core plus a number of modules that government may need to build their websites. It's also got accessible themes that fit the um, branding. Previous Next actually worked with um, Agamo on the branding. So I think from memory there are six themes to, to go with AGOV. Um, and again, that can be downloaded um, and set up as well. 
So a few things with ARIA validation. Um, ARIA attributes don't validate in HTML4, so if you're using any of the standard validators, it's going to spit up errors. It doesn't actually mean that it isn't conformant and you sort of have to um, ignore the, um, there's a success criteria about um, uh, conformance uh, in uh, the web content accessibility guidelines. So you kind of just ignore that one um, with an understanding that you've done rigorous testing to test that your ARIA attributes are actually working um, as expected. Um, you can use the um, HTML5 doc type with ARIA markup and then you can validate it using the W3C NU markup validation service. Um, last time I checked, they didn't, they didn't sort of say it was completely stable, but at least it won't actually throw up all of the areas, errors if you are using um, ARIA attributes. So a few takeaways. Um, dynamic content no longer has to be inaccessible to assistive technologies, and it's really nice to see an audience who I seem to be preaching to the choir in the sense that you already know and believe that. You can start using ARIA now if you're not already, and there are easy wins like the landmark roles and the forms that, that you can um, form attributes um, that you can use now that are really easy to do. And the one thing I always think is it's kind of fun. You know, we live for a challenge. Um, development is, is all about challenges. It's all about you know, finding solutions to things, and accessibility is no different. It is as, as much of a challenge and as creative as you know, a lot of the other endeavours you do when you're solving an issue. It's just a different type of issue. Um, the obligatory slide of don't forget to fill out the session evaluation. So um, my session creating dynamic and accessible content in Drupal 7 using Way Aria. I've got a bit.ly link there, which is um, actually you can have a look at it at SlideShare. I'm not going to read that out. Um, and just a reminder, so the slides are on SlideShare with all of the links through to the elements that I've referenced today. The videos um, are on YouTube and when you visit the SlideShare, you'll get the pages of the ARIA documents, so they're the specs. Um, some ARIA resources that I think are useful, particularly if you're getting started. Um, and even more ARIA resources, these are more library-based ones. So. Um, the accessible jQuery UI that we saw demonstrated before, Yahoo Accessibility Code Library. Yahoo has a fantastic accessibility blog. It's, uh, they, they expose all of the things that they're doing. They shove all of their code into the code library that you can go and have a look at. So it's a great resource to go and look at what you can do with ARIA and learn from um, what they've done. Um, and also the Mozilla Dev um, Developer Network ARIA. Um, it's great and it also has quite a lot of links out to um, other content. Um, great blog where someone sort of rounded up a lot of the um, screen captures of people using ARIA um, in different situations and so on and so forth. So all of those are available on the slides and I'm done. And I'm on time, I think. <laughs> Questions? And please feel free, they don't necessarily have to be ARIA related. If, um, if they're more broader web accessibility, happy to take questions about that. Yes, so um, the technical spec is the one you want to have a look at. Uh, the authoring practices is also a good one. The technical spec is the um, normative document. Um, the authoring practices sort of look at how you put that into practice and what have you. The prime is a good introduction, sort of ov an overview of the issues and what way ARIA does and so on. So they form the suite of documents. The menus were accessible. Um, yes, yeah, sort of. I guess. Uh, yes, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's an AGOV website. I didn't know this morning. Um, and I think it's using Superfish from, I can't remember how I looked at that, but I thought, oh, I think it's using Superfish. I guess it comes down to um, accessibility versus usability. Often we get quite caught up in is it WCAG 2 compliant? Does it meet the success criteria? And that menu definitely meets the success criteria. It's keyboard accessible, it's reading out all of the labels for the, the um, menu items and that. 
which is why I say yes is successful. And it even had shortcut keys which you could hear the screen reader announcing so that if you were re revisiting the site, you could use the shortcut keys to get the menu. By comparison though, I guess, um, with a menu of 13 items, and thankfully that one, that was the longest menu in, in the set. The others weren't nearly as long or didn't have any sub-menus. But from a usability perspective, if you're going through, we visually sort of look at the top level and say, oh, what information am I looking for? That's the element I want. Let me expand that and look at that. The way this is put together, that doesn't give the user that option um, because it, it's actually listing am them as a nested list. So, it, it, yeah, it does come back to, I think, what I call user experience and getting away from the checklist mentality of it is the CAG2 compliant. It is compliant out of the box. There's, yeah, yeah, that's right. And look, there's always there's always arguments also for um, backwards compatibility and um, graceful dig dig dig. dig thank you. <laughs> I knew someone would help me out um, from an assistive technology perspective. So um, I don't have all of the the stats that you might like. You probably would need to look at. Um, which of the ARIA attributes were supported in what assistive technologies. And you get into this bind because it's not, it's not a problem for NVDA because NVDA is free and every time someone pushes out an update, you get it. And the same with VoiceOver and even Orca on Linux. You get those updates just in part, as, part and parcel. But for JAWS users and in the commercial, as a commercial product, it is the, the you know, it has a huge base. It's often cost prohibitive for people to be upgrading their technology, um, and so it's it's all, there's always a little bit of a juggling act about when do you, you know, make it accessible using newer technologies and when don't you? And I don't have a good answer. <laughs> it's like, do you support IE6 or not? <laughs> it's sort of that question, that sort of question. Any further questions? Wonderful. Well, thank you all very much for um, coming. Please feel free to grab me if you had a question you didn't want to ask publicly. Um, and I look forward to meeting you again. Thank you.